This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship at Orman Beach Presbyterian Church. I'm Joe Anderson. Pastor Wheeler is away this week and asked me to fill in, and he'll be back this week. There are many, many announcements in your bulletin, and uh, feel free to take those home with you and, and look over and see how you might join him to the life of the church here at the church. And Jamie Haas has a very special announcement. Just real quick, we have a celebrity in our midst today, Miss Dorothy Sanders, who is celebrating her birthday this week, 100 years old. She has bloomed. At, in the fellowship hall, cake, wonderful things, punch, deliciousness, and the ability to give Dorothy some wonderful hugs and congratulations. And with her is her sister Margaret, who is here to visit and celebrate with her. So if you forgot a card, her, her name and address is in the book, because her birthday is not really until Wednesday, so you can get it to her in time. So happy, happy, happy. Happy birthday, we love you.
But his servant said, How can I set this before a hundred people? So he repeated, Give it to the people and let them eat. For thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left. He said before them, They ate and they had some left, according to the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For our psalm reading this morning, doing something just a tiny bit different. We're going to have a few words of the psalm, and then we're going to follow it up by singing a verse of This is My Father's World, Staying Seated. I think it's wonderful how the words of the psalm and of the hymn speak to each other. Psalm 145, beginning at verse 10. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, 
So they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left there by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who was to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountainside by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. This is the word of God. God, we thank you for your word, the story of your grace. Please be seated. gospel reading today contains two of the most well-known and best-loved miracle stories of Jesus. The feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle story in all, found in all four gospels. The only one. The account of Jesus walking on water occurs in three of them. John's version of these miracles differs in some significant ways from the other versions, and we'll explore John's version this morning. But first, a word about miracles in general. We are rational people. Most of us grew up parsing sentences and memorizing the periodic table. Most of us want clear-cut answers to everything. But the miracle stories throw a wrench into the machinery of our rational thinking. We want to ask, or maybe we're afraid to ask, did these miracles of Jesus really happen as described in the Bible? And if we say, yes, of course, they did, then why, if Jesus is still a living presence among us, why do we not see miracles today? And if we said, we do see modern miracles, then why do they happen for some people and not for others? We start asking these questions as children and youth. And if we're honest, most of us still ask these questions. And of course, these are impossible questions to answer in one sermon, or maybe even at all. But just for today, Let's concentrate on these two miracle stories, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus walking on water, and let's see what John, the gospel writer, wants us to learn from them. Our story opens on a hillside by the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus sits down with his disciples around him. It's near the time of Passover. Jesus sees the large crowd coming toward them. The crowd kept following Jesus because they had seen the great signs of healing that he had done. Was the crowd hoping to see more signs? Were they desperate for healing for themselves and their loved ones? 
somehow Jesus anticipates that the people will be hungry. And he asks Philip a question to test him. Jesus already knew that he was going to feed these hungry people. So why did he test Philip? Perhaps Jesus wanted to test how far along Philip was with his own faith development. To see if Philip had begun to know who Jesus truly is. Well, obviously Philip hadn't gone through confirmation class yet. For when Jesus asked Philip, where are we going to buy bread for these folks? <clears throat> Philip answers by saying, Jesus, we just don't have the budget for that kind of ministry. <laughs> but Philip's only being realistic, isn't he? Andrew does a little better. He has been out in the crowd and has found a little boy with some barley loaves and fish. But then Andrew says, but that's not nearly enough for this crowd. Both Philip and Andrew are acting from an orientation of scarcity. Jesus, we just don't have enough to do what you are asking. Much like Elisha's servant in the passage from 2 Kings that Trevor read for us. When Elisha tells the servant to feed the crowd with a few loaves of barley bread and corn, the servant says, how can I set this before a hundred people? It's not enough. Jesus sees the crowd. He sees their need. He directs the disciples to have the 5,000 men plus the women and children to sit down in the green grass. Do you hear an echo of Psalm 23? He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Giving thanks over the meager food offering, Jesus himself distributed the bread and the fish to everyone, and they all had as much as they wanted. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. There was an abundance so much so that there were 12 baskets full of leftovers. Nothing was lost. The fact that John places this event near the time of the Passover is not an accident. John is the only gospel writer to do so. With the Passover, the people celebrated their ancestors' escape from Egypt through the wilderness and into the promised land. And as Moses led them, God provided manna from heaven to feed their weary bodies, just enough for each day. Give us today our daily bread. Here on the hillside, this now well-fed crowd may be remembering God's gift of manna and that Moses had foretold that one day God would raise up another prophet like Moses to lead the people. And the crowd gets a little stirred up. Instead of taking an afternoon nap, they exclaim among themselves, here is the prophet promised to us. Here is the new Moses come to lead us. Let's make him king. And just before they seize Jesus by force to make him king, Jesus gets away up the mountainside. You see, being an earthly king was not Jesus' mission. The people wanted their Messiah to rescue them from Rome and from their current hardships in life. Like Philip, they did not yet see Jesus as the giver of life of living water, of abundant grace and mercy. Not yet. Our story continues. While Jesus rests on the mountain, the disciples get into a boat to journey toward Capernaum. Oh, and now, now the story is told from the disciples' point of view. And because of that, we can try to picture ourselves in the boat with the disciples. 
It is night. It is dark. And a strong wind begins to blow, making the sea rough with waves. And even though some of the disciples are professional fishermen, this could not have been an easy journey, with the sea roiling all around them and the wind in their faces. When they had reached the middle of this little sea, they looked up and saw, they saw Jesus walking on the water, coming toward them, and they were terrified. Wouldn't you be terrified? I, I know I would be. In the other Gospels, the disciples do not recognize Jesus, and they are terrified because they think they are seeing a ghost. But in John, the disciples are not confused about Jesus' identity. They know it is Jesus they're seeing. They are terrified because they are witnessing a manifestation of the divine, a theophany, a sighting of God. The God in Jesus, who turned water into wine, healed the sick, multiplied the loaves, is now taming the waters of the sea. Jesus says to them, don't be afraid. It is I. I am. Then the, the disciples wanted to take Jesus into the boat. The Greek word there means they were glad to bring him on board. And immediately they found safe passage to their destination. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. I said earlier that we are rational people. Over time, and especially after the age of enlightenment, theologians sought to explain away the miracle stories. Some thinkers, like our very own Thomas Jefferson, wanted to strip from scripture all mention of miracles, visitation of angels, and even the resurrection stories, making the Bible a practical moral code for Christian living. Others kept the miracle stories, but had ready explanations for them. In the feeding of the 5,000, for instance, it was suggested that the people in the crowd had food up their sleeves and in their pockets, <laughs> unwilling to share at first, until Jesus encouraged them. In this sense, the miracle was a simple lesson in generosity, something along the lines of the old folk story, Stone Soup. Do you know that story? A stranger comes to a village but no one is willing to share their food with him. He fills a large pot with water and a few stones and brings the pot to boil over a fire, saying to the villagers, I am making stone soup and I will share it with you. One by one, the curious villagers add their own ingredients to the pot. Carrot here, some spices there, a little meat, until the soup becomes a savory stew and all are fed. A lovely story. But can we really comfortably reduce the feeding of the 5,000 to a simple morality lesson? I wonder. In a similar way, the miracle of Jesus walking on water was explained. Perhaps the theologian said, Jesus was only up to his ankles in shallow water. Or, Jesus knew where the underwater reef was and he was just walking along on top of it. Or, he was actually walking beside the sea on the shore and not in the water at all. Those sound like logical explanations. But if we choose today to explain away the miraculous aspect of these stories, have we become a culture 
that has all but lost its capacity to wonder. We say that with God all things are possible. Can we allow God to open our eyes, our hearts, and yes, our minds to see beyond the easy explanations, simple solutions, quick answers? Since I'm the one standing in the pulpit today, let me share with you what I see in these two miracle stories. Above all, and in essence, I believe the miracle stories in John point to the identity of Jesus as the Son of God. The miracles put a spotlight on the grace and glory of Jesus Christ. The feeding of the 5,000 may not be so much about bread as it is about who Jesus is. As God provided manna in the wilderness, Jesus reveals himself as the one with the resources to meet the full range of human need. Jesus himself is the source of living bread, the source of life, of unending grace. When Jesus walks on the sea, he comes to the disciples with a profound and grace-filled act of pastoral care to allay their fears, to ensure safe passage, to show them that God has been, is, and will be their rescue. By walking on water, Jesus reveals himself to be divine, one with God, the one who shares in God's work in the world. And what is that work? What does the Bible tell us? To feed the hungry, to heal the sick, to make disciples, to act with justice and mercy and walk humbly with our God. And above everything, to love without measure. That's a really big job. Do we have what it takes to do the work of God? Do we have the resources? Well, certainly not by ourselves. But Jesus is a living presence among us. Jesus can free us from the mindset of scarcity to embrace the good news of abundance. In the hands of Jesus, little can become much the few can become the many, and the weak can become strong. When God is at work, there is always abundance. The journey in this life is not easy. The work may be joyful, but it is also hard. We can get discouraged if we think that we are alone. But let us remember those disciples in the boat on the storming sea of Galilee. There are times in our lives when, metaphorically speaking, suddenly the wind gets up and the sea becomes rough. And as we struggle to make our way through, sometimes we are aware of a presence with us. And if we listen, through the roar of the waves and the wind, we may hear the voice that says, it is I, I am. Don't be afraid. And if we are ready then to take Jesus on board, we may find ourselves sooner than expected at the harbor where we will be calm and secure once more. And that, my friends, is a miracle. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
as they experience devastating wildfires. We pray for all the people in the world who are working to save others during these destructive events and for those who are working to save all who are affected by COVID-19. Lord, when we would make you a king, forgive us. When we are caught up in the storms of life, come to us, calm our fears, and help us to reach our destinations. Now through the power of the Holy Spirit and in the love of Christ, be to you the glory for all generations. We continue to pray in the words Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Freely you have received, freely give. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. <laughs> Jesus Christ and the abiding presence 
of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.